We hit the button. What's up? How you guys doing? We are doing a compass today. Uh, we're going to be doing 20% on the front, and we're going to try and make the rear match that as close as we can. Um, so we have to go a little bit darker, but we're going to end up doing 50% on the rear. And the rear actually meters a little bit lighter. So we can talk about meters today. We can talk about some film shades today. Um, but essentially, it, it becomes a little tricky. Oh, I got to change that. It becomes a little tricky to exactly match factory tint that becomes a little bit lighter. So the rear actually meters at like 23. 23, 24, something like that, right in there. So it's not far off of 20, so most people would put 20 on the front to match the back. But the, the issue then is when you do 20 on the front, that's going to make it meter darker than 20. So we're going to do 20 on the front, and then we're going to do 50 on the back, because he also wanted to do the whole thing too. So, And the fact that it's going to be carbon means that it's going to be more comfortable. It's going to be nice. Super, super duper, Daniel Reyna. Daniel Reyna super chatted nine dollars ninety nine cents. Kumusta, Kuya Master Matt. Kumusta. That sounds like if I were to say it. How you doing, man? Thank you so much for the ten. I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. Kind of uh, finally recovered a little bit from all the moving and stuff. We're like mostly settled in and everything. And uh, we just ended up doing a backsplash in the kitchen over the past three days and we were a little stressed out doing that <laughs> because we've never done one. They're not as simple as they look. Daniel, Daniel Reyna again. $9 Left my coffee cents. over there. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. It is a good morning. I forgot to take the garbage out. Well, I didn't forget. I was too lazy to take the trash out. We're still waiting on a trash can, too. And then, uh, and then they came and got it right before I was going to take it out. And I was like, damn it. How do you recognize the... Oh, but thank you, Daniel, for the... Uh, for another 10, I really appreciate that. How do you recognize the right plotter here in Europe? We don't have workhorses. Um, you should have the, the ones that are, at least are notable that I hear a lot about. GraphTech, Roland, those are going to be on the more expensive side. Vinyl Express is a good one. Um, that's kind of like GraphTech's like cheaper cousin. And then uh, Jaguar. Any of those, and you will be, you'll be getting a good, good plotter. Any opinion on Lexan? Oh, I got a lot of opinions. Um, I actually tested out the Pure Max, um, like kind of. And to be honest, it was genuinely a good, uh, a good recommendation. So I wouldn't touch the cheaper carbons, but their, their Pure Max was be much better, actually. And that, that included Haze. I was actually pretty, pretty impressed with that. So that, that's good. That's very good. Have you tinted? Hey! They finally warmed up. Reach out to Geo. Oh, hang on. I'm waiting for it to pop up because I don't want to repeat it. I feel like Lexan takes longer to shrink. It does. It still is slower, but it was more consistent. So that was nice. Difference wasn't huge, Daniel but it was Rainer noticeable. Super chatted $4.99. Reach out to Geo. Shall they never contacted me. But which of their carbon is a good substitute for ceramic? I'd call them. 
I'd call them again. I, I mean, they're, they're generally on it with all their contacts and stuff like that. Uh, which one of their carbon is a good substitute for ceramic? Thank you for the five again. I don't, I, I don't think carbon is a great substitute for ceramic, um, but they're, uh, to be honest, I stick with C2. Hang on, let's bring this back up. There we go. Um, so they recently released a, a carbon plus line and then their apex line. Um, I stick with their C2 right now. So they're Pro Classic, their C2, and their Pro Nano. Those ones are kind of been proven. And then um, the Apex and the Carbon Plus, those are newer lines that are really, really good. Very, very promising. Um, they're not completely consistent on windshields with the lighter shades right now. Um, so even if you're changing up your soap and stuff like that, they're having some curling issues off of windshields, which, you know, that's why I always try everything. As much as I like any one particular company, I'm always going to test their stuff before I bring it in. Um, so I, right now, I think their C2 is awesome, um, and their Pro Nano is awesome. So I, but yeah, I, there definitely isn't a substitute for carbon with ceramic. They're in two different leagues. With really any carbon, the darker you go, the more heat that it's going to block. And generally speaking, 20% on anybody's carbon, good or bad, is going to block out like 50% of the heat because there's nothing added past that. There's no microphone. Let's fix that. And then we, uh, we'll start this one. Where's the... Oh. Oh. Is it on the... No, it's not. Guys, you can't plug an iPhone connector into a uh, USB-C, I just checked. <laughs> what the heck? Why do I even, oh, that's because this one. We need clean power. I think that's gonna be this one. Let me know if the microphone buzzes. Oh wait, no, that's the receiver or transmitter. Where's the receiver? Oh yeah. Oh, it is on here. There we go. This is why I need two sets of microphones, but then I wouldn't charge them either, so that's got other problems. Be more aggressive with the heat with laxin and start starts to lay down good. Yeah, so you just have to be ready for it. Um, and with the cheaper stuff, the biggest problem that it gives people is initially it moves really quickly and then it slows way down. So you have to just adapt with that. Where C2 is really consistent throughout and it moves faster um, regardless. So that's generally why like, if you've been shrinking for any period of time, you can adapt pretty quickly. Otherwise, you're gonna need something that's a little bit more user friendly. But no matter what, um, Learning how to shrink is, is just always an interesting thing. It takes time. But knowing kind of what to expect will help change that. All right, so let's get this in here. So we're going to be doing a little bit, not an unusual match, but something just a little bit different. So matching the front to the rear was, was one of the biggest priorities of this one. He just wants like a nice consistent look. And uh, this client is coming from um, a car that I actually tinted in like 2013, which is, which is super cool. Okay, that was a good question too. But, so when it comes to this one, the back actually meters a little bit lighter than 20%, meaning that when you put 20% on the front, it's not going to match. So then you have to do the back a little bit darker to compensate for it if you're doing 20 on the front. So what we're going to end up doing is, I, I actually metered this ahead of time, um, and it comes really close. 
So we're going to do 20 on the front doors, then we're going to do 50 on the rear. And that's going to be it's going to be very very close. It'll look good. Pro Nano versus V Nano, warranty aside. So it's just got lower grade materials, V Nano does. So it's a ceramic film and this is, this is the thing. You'll find there's cheaper, just like anything, like there's cheaper and better versions. So when it comes to Pro Nano versus V Nano, Pro Nano is a hard film to beat. It's, it's a great ceramic film. V-Nano is a good ceramic film. It just has lower grade polyesters and stuff. So it's just not gonna block out as much heat and it's not gonna be as clear either. So if you're gonna pick one or the other, I mean, I'm obviously gonna go for the better stuff. I, when it comes to any of those categories, I just don't, I don't screw around with, with cheap. Because when it comes down to like how much you're actually paying per car, the difference becomes kind of insignificant. So, specs shows V Nano. Um, look at the, I haven't actually paid attention to the V Nano specs. Look at the TSER number. Um, that should be the most telling number. Is it really, that is actually lower than the, uh, than the Pro Nano? See, this is where specs just get confusing. I stopped looking at spec sheets, honestly, a long time ago. And every time a new film comes out, like when we were looking at Geo, like Carbon Plus and Apex, like we looked right at the, you know, we were paying pretty close attention to the IR numbers and it's like, oh, it was great. Then I put it in front of my heat box. And then we started talking about it a little bit more. So what you, turns out what you really have to do is look at the TSER number. That'll give you like a more realistic world approach. So 50% of the heat comes from IR and about 50% of the heat comes from the visible spectrum. And this is I think why it gets lost on a lot of people too. Um, light is measured in wavelengths and you get everything from radios to x-rays to UV, um, everything is in, is in like light waves. So when you, a lot of these meters, they measure, they can measure a snippet of that spectrum and you need to do a broad reading, so you need to take measurements across the entire spectrum, and you're really not gonna be able to do that with just one meter. You'll find meters that measure certain um, spots in that spectrum, so they take readings across the whole spectrum, and then that's what the TSER numbers typically are. That would be the most universal way to measure film from one film company to the other. But any film company is gonna wanna measure their film so it looks the best, right? The numbers, because it's all marketing. Whatever numbers that they print on a spec sheet, if you just go off of reading them, that's the easiest thing that you can do and go like, oh, well this number's better than this number. There's actually a post in my group, we were talking about this a little bit this morning. Um, I don't think spec numbers um, I, like it helps with pointing you in a particular direction to like check some things out. But other than that, you need to buy the film, you need to put it on a heat box, you need to look at what you're getting off of it, like literally feel the difference, and then also put it on your car. Because at the end of the day, you can get all tied up in numbers, but what does it actually feel like on your car? So you need comparisons. So like if you're interested in this film versus that film, get both and literally put one on one window or half half and just try them out. 
I would order like whatever your most popular shade is gonna be and just get like half rolls or whatever you can get your hands on, samples, and then just check it out. That way like you're also like, you're, you're probably never gonna have a client that actually asks you about those numbers anyways. But you'll be super educated about like, oh yeah, I checked out this film, I checked out this film, people are talking about this one, I tried this one out. And then, yeah, I don't, I don't know what people are talking about. I seem to like these ones the best. So whatever you like the best is probably going to be the best choice for your clients anyways. Pro Nano IR76, TSER62. V Nano IR81, TSER63, both 20% same shade. So what I would do is I would pick both of them up and feel if there's actually that similar, similarity. Both IR and TSER and V Nano are here, but don't feel like it, it is on my truck. Oh, cool, so you actually did get both already. That's awesome. Both 20% IR and TSER on VNAM are higher, but don't feel. So the difference between 62 and 63 is basically negligible because, you know, it's a 1% difference. It's like, can you tell the difference between 20% and 21%? Probably not. <laughs> but that, so that's what I'm told on on spec sheets. Everybody will say, look at the TSER numbers. So then you start questioning what you are actually feeling on the vehicle itself. You're doing it exactly right. Try them, and then if one feels better than the other, go in that direction. Specs be damned. So with the, uh, with the V-Nano, it's just um, a lower grade polyester, so you're also going to want to look at um, you're also gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna look at basically just the clarity difference. So when it's out in the sun, and to do this, I really do like a 50-50 split. I'm actually making a video with a film, 50-50 split. That way you can just tell right side by side which one's clearer, the color difference, which one you like better. You should see a clarity difference between the V-Nano and the Pro Nano for sure. If you didn't, I would be kind of shocked. But that's kind of funny about the TSER number. But I've talked to them about it. They said it just doesn't have as high grade polyesters and stuff. So you're probably gonna notice a clarity difference. As far as actual heat numbers, I just kind of assume that it's not gonna be as good. But if they're saying the same numbers, or one slightly higher than the other and you feel them and they don't, then that's where I'm like, dude, I, I don't even know about spec sheets. I'm just going off of basically what, what like manufacturers have said. And then, I, and then at the end of the day, I just put them on my car and see how they feel because I learned a long time ago. Any film company is gonna talk very highly of their own film. <laughs> They're all biased, including me to some regard, right? I mean, I gotta like what I use, so I'm gonna lean a little bit more toward, biased towards it, but I, at the end of the day, I gotta like it. So I always, I wanted to jump the gun and just carry like my, my when I looked at the IR numbers, I was just like, oh, I'm gonna take Carbon Plus, I'm gonna replace uh, Pro Nano, and then I'm gonna carry Apex, and then I'll have Apex, uh, Carbon Plus, and Pro Classic, and that'll kind of round my lineup. And then I tried them, and I'm still using C2 and Pro Nano. <laughs> Carbon Plus isn't quite as good as Pro Nano. And then Apex, I think that is an awesome, awesome film. Um, but then it's, we had some curling issues on a windshield, so uh, I don't fully trust it yet until we iron out what's going on with that. We've been working on that for a little while now. I'm using an experimental version of Apex right now. They're both clear. Pro Nano seems more neutral. 
uh, when looking out of it, V-Nano looks funny and not natural. Interesting. So if they're actually both clear and like really strong sunlight, that's surprising. Uh, V-Nano is never one that I actually tried. I would just hear people's comments about it. But like when, so this goes even with Lexan. If you do all your tests and you genuinely just like like the film, like the company, um, everything seems good, and you're just like you you never really know until you, you know, take it into your business, and that's where you really start to find out about a film company. Um, but if you do everything and you like it, like I mean, five year warranty doesn't mean it's just gonna fail right at the five year mark, right? Five years is a long time. If it ticked all the right boxes, I'd carry it. Have you gotten to the hatch glass? No, I generally just cut these out on a plotter at this point, but I'll, I'll take a look. We might actually hand cut it because anytime somebody tells me that, usually means I have to hand cut it. <laughs> I've done so many, like I did so many hatch glasses that I was plotter cutting them for a while. If you go back in the live streams, you'll see how I tackle a lot of these. But we'll take a look. I asked Burns about the V-Nano. He said V-Nano is good, just made with cheaper materials. Um, so they only offer a five year, but it'll last a long time after that. Yeah, that's basically what he told me too. So like from a, from a business perspective, like they're caught between a, a rock and a hard place, right? They want to have films that accommodate a, you know, a range of needs. So that's where they felt bringing out a more budget friendly ceramic, like, cause they have more people that are ordering through them than me. <laughs> so I have my opinion, and then it'll be a hundred people to asking them about a cheaper ceramic, right? So they take all that feedback, and then they look for options. So they want to protect their brand. They don't just want to slap their name on a cheap ceramic. So they found something that they felt was good enough. Um, but I never just leaned in that direction because... Um, for for my business, I'm all, like it never made sense, and I, I thought about it for a long time. This is like, does it make sense to just be a dye-free shop? Does it make sense to do this? Does it make sense to do that? And something you'll see across any product line is a clear upgrade path, and the fuzzier you make that path you know, the harder it, harder it is for somebody to make a decision because you just, you don't have a clear reason why you would pick one product over the next. So one of the things with window films is heat. Like that's probably, <laughs> that's honestly the main thing. I could also do warranty. So I could carry one film for one year uh, and then the next film up that maybe be five and then and then a, a lifetime 10 year warranty or whatever you wanna do. But so many people, then you look at the, what the market is doing and so many people just take any film, whether or not it has a long warranty and then they'll say it has a lifetime warranty. So a lifetime warranty is something that's been around for, for a long time at this point. Does Apex film curl on the dots only? Uh, honestly, no. Hello, Tin Studio. How can I help you? Yeah. Oh, good. How are you? Uh huh. Yeah, um, we took a look at it. Um, the only thing, like we got something in the mail too. The only thing I, I wasn't sure of yet was if there was a sod quote attached to that.
Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Okay, that works. Um, the other hang up is we're we're looking into either a deck or a patio, so we were trying to make that decision and we we're told that uh, we need to do if we're gonna do a patio that needs to be done first. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, so we definitely don't want that. So we're trying to figure out, I mean, we're trying to take recommendations from other companies. Um, and I think we called one that you guys recommended and they're all backed up for the rest of the year. So we're just kind of trying to figure out what we can do before it gets too late and it's already pretty late in the season from what we understand. Sure. Right. Okay. If we do a deck, though, I mean, we're told that's going to be probably the safest bet to go. So if we do a lawn, doing a deck afterwards wouldn't matter. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I'll make a couple of phone calls and let me give you a call back. I mean, we're probably going to have you guys do the, the lawn and the sprinkler system. I just, I, it, uh, we just got to figure out right now um, what a patio company can do and how quick they can do it. Um, and we know everything's a little tight. We just closed on the house, though, in late July. So we're trying to figure all this stuff out very quickly. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. No, I appreciate that info. Yeah, let me figure out then what we're going to do. Um, and then I will give you guys a call back as soon as I can figure that out. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. I'm trying to figure out what we're doing on the house. Lawns or patio or patio and whatnot. There's so many houses that were sold very quickly. And so we currently don't have a lawn and we have to figure out what we're gonna do, but we don't want them to put in the lawn and then have the lawn wrecked. Fun stuff, especially in Michigan. Cause uh, you know, we had what, like two months of summer so far and then <laughs> I guess I, I should have asked how late that they'll put in a lawn, but it's already August, August, September, October. Um, and like, you know, you want it to settle and stuff. So what's up, Korea Tinter? I have a question. Can you tell me the manufacturer of Geo? I'm wondering uh, if they own the factory. They don't. I can tell you that much. Um, Kind of something that I'm a little bit more free, you know, uh, have I said on stream? Like, it's not that 
difficult to find out, but you do have to kind of ask around to figure it out. Um, hmm, I'm, I'm trying to think of how much I can probably say. I usually don't care for the most part, but I always got to respect companies too. Um, all right, fuck it. Um, it kind of depends on what you're ordering. And you'll see, this also makes their lines a little bit more clear. Um, because when you just look at films across the board, you know, you see Pro Nano, V Nano, Apex, Carbon Plus, and you're, you're like, where do some of these products make sense? So, um, a good number of their films, so like, you gotta look at what they kind of started with. And they've been looking, they've been doing carbon uh, ceramic films. Uh, in the past, and then they had uh, more established lines like uh, Pro Nano. So a, a handful of their films come from uh, Guari, which is what you're going to see from companies like Expel, um, who else? Solar FX, Expel, Solar FX, um, Global. So like pretty damn good manufacturing. Every film that comes out of there is gonna be a little bit different, one to the next, so you can't just like order, nobody's getting the same film, they're all kind of like ordering their own, but that being said, there's only so many ways that you can change it, so you will see similarities there. Um, but logistics are kind of a big problem too. So one thing that they were definitely keeping in mind is being able to have more products available to people in the event that there's a big manufacturing issue or with so many people ordering from the same manufacturer, obviously you have companies that are then competing uh, for films. And then you just eventually need to differentiate yourself. So can't say for sure about the rest, but I can tell you um, a handful of them are going to be coming from from Guari, so that's going to be like your uh, your Pro Nano. Basically, the ones that don't have uh, carbon in them. I think that's also why you don't see Axpel with the carbon line. As so far as I'm aware, they order exclusively through uh, through Guari. So. So it's got its pros and cons. I think with some companies, you see them get pigeonholed into, into problems. So if like you own the manufacturing facility, it costs you millions of dollars to invest in like this one technology to make your film this way, right? And it could be the latest and it could be the greatest, but then you wanna get your money out of it, right? So you have to run with that equipment. And then meanwhile, tech advances and then another company starts developing their own new manufacturing style, right? And then it's even more expensive than to rebuild in a different style. So the pros and, like there's definitely some pros and cons. It allows you to be a little bit more nimble, um, but then again, you are kind of beholden to manufacturers too as well. So at the end of the day, um, you know, a manufacturer can definitely sell its own film, but it's also incentivized to just sell as much film. Like any maker of one particular thing, it's going to be kind of incentivized to make as much of it and let the brands kind of figure it out. So like that's that's what a manufacturer like Wari does. They're selling to literally thousands of film companies. or making thousands of SKUs for film companies around the world. Like they're just, they just make lots of window film. That's what they do. Hey, <laughs> speaking, speaking of, what's up Burns, how you doing?
Oh, this is the wrong box for it. Let me put this in a shorter box. Fire away, man. Oh, that's, that's the client's phone. Sounds like the bat phone. <laughs> uh, Why well, use tape under the carpet shield? So it makes it um, quicker to apply. So the idea here was originally get a quick sticky plastic. It's like this and then stick it to the door panel. Well, the problem is a lot of door panels don't like things being stuck to them. So it depends on the material that, and like if there's anything that kind of, you know, repels water and whatnot. So this tape sticks to damn near everything but still pulls clean. So I can rely on putting a piece of tape down here that sticks to the door panel. Carpet shield doesn't, isn't quite as aggressive, but it will stick to the top of the tape. So it just makes it quicker to kind of create some sort of a barrier there. I don't think it's the most elegant solution, but. Okay, Burns, somebody was asking about, um, somebody was asking about V-Nano versus Pro-Nano um, in regards to like the TSER numbers. And then I'm also, I forget how much I can say. <laughs> but I also feel like I get so many questions and at the end of the day, everybody picks apart where window film comes from. So I forget how much I can say about that. But I said pretty much what I know. Pro Nano has a high TSE, higher TSER than V Nano. Not in the comment that I got. What the hell? Do I gotta go look at a spec sheet? <laughs> he was saying it. Oh, he was saying in the twenty percent range. He said V Nano was like one percent higher than Pro Nano, and then he bought both and tried them, and like Pro Nano better. Uh oh. Hang on one second. Um, Canon. Canon. There we go. One sec. Okay, hang on one sec. All right, let's let's uh, let's check this out real quick. All right, so we're gonna look here really quick just to, just to see. So Pro Nano and the TSER, that's the total solar energy rejected. That's this number here. Um, so in 20%, that is, so Pro Nano Ceramic 20, that's gonna be 62. Then if you go down to V Nano, it's 63. See, ah, he wasn't kidding. So that's where this can get a little bit confusing. Can you clear that up for us? So I wasn't kidding. It was one, one, like I know 1% is kind of like an insignificant amount, but he said he noticed a bigger difference when he actually put it on the vehicle. So like films like that being compared, and then you look at, if you look at just a spec sheet, this is where I say just throw the spec sheets out the window sometimes because they just make it confusing and just go with what you like best on your car. But when you're ordering stuff, it definitely gets confusing. 
first car ever was last month, a Honda Accord. I didn't realize how curved the windows were, so I fucked it up. After watching your Accord live stream, I went back and fixed it. Thanks, man. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, a lot of the Honda Accords actually have pretty rounded glass. Like, they're not... It, it's... For most... For, like, most experience centers, it's going to be pretty normal. But, yeah, they actually have reasonably rounded uh, door glass along with back glass. Thought it was carbon plus? Uh, no, we were talking about V-Nano versus Pro-Nano. But it's good to have you here. So that way we can pick your brain about this stuff. All right, so we're gonna get some door windows on here in the meantime. So if you guys have any film questions, if you got some film questions, especially about carbon and ceramic films and some of the differences, With the Honda Accord, it's because I didn't, I didn't snap shrink them. I didn't shrink them at all. Oh yeah, that's gonna be a problem with most cars, whether or not they're really curved or not. I always shrink like every door window, just just some, if, especially if you're not pulling seals. Some measure uh, to the some do averages from 780 to 2500. Some measure 900 to 1000 or 14. All manufacturers put their best IR numbers up. So the confusing part then from somebody that's buying it is they don't know that and they're seeing everything under one company. So when they're looking at the numbers across the board, they don't, they, like it's all got Geo's name on it. So as far as they're concerned, it, it comes out of your backyard. So, yeah, that's kind of what I figure. Every manufacturer has a slightly different way of measuring it. They're going to put their best foot forward. They're going to try and make them look good. But is there some type of, I mean, I imagine there's some type of uniform thing that you could do to kind of like paint it in perspective for people that are shopping around so it's less confusing rather than looking at this company's really awesome numbers versus this manufacturer, but it's all under Geo, so they're not, they don't, they don't know too much about it. They don't know as much as you. <laughs> I think it's like, we have five different manufacturers making us film. Yeah, so like, you know how Fusion, Fusion does, um, okay, there's the durometer number, and then there's what the, the squeegee actually feels like, but they do something really nice. They actually put on all their squeegees, like a good, or like a harder or like a softer and they have kind of like a sliding scale. So like the orange crush is like a three, the flat out is, is, is like a six, but the durometer numbers are like completely different. Especially when it comes to like the red line and stuff like that. 
just talking to people, I think it'd be helpful if you had some sort of like a an easy to understand scale where it's like, these are the numbers, <laughs> but this is kind of where it legitimately stacks up uh, one to the next, just so it's a little bit more clear for people. I mean, I always suggest calling, but you know, people talking to people, they have to make a phone call. <laughs> I watch your videos, I learn and gain knowledge. Good, glad to hear it. Oh god, it turned back off. Let's turn that back on. But yeah, especially with that post in the group, it's always an interesting discussion. And it's always something that we're gonna have to kind of rehash. You don't really know until you've been around film for a while. So just getting into it, like... Until then, specs be damned. Get the film. When you pay more for the film, generally it's better. <laughs> Even if the numbers say otherwise. There's always, like, those... Uh, less tangible things that you just don't think of. Like if you look at every film on a spec sheet, they they're all look very similar. But you know, you, then all of a sudden you pick up a film and you're like, oh, this looks like shit. You don't know that until you buy it. Try stuff. I would do something, but I don't think enough people care. <laughs> can you only use baby, can you use only baby shampoo or Dawn? No. No, you can use more. Um, there's a more recent thing uh, about Dawn, unfortunately, that isn't super great. So I have been re recommending um, because it's rather sticky. Um, I use about three ounces of Dawn, a little less than that, but about three ounces of Dawn, or three ounces of baby shampoo, excuse me, and then like a punch of Dawn. Um, I've since subbed that with, God, what's it called? Uh, Fusion All Type. It's, it's all right. It works. I wouldn't say it's amazing, but it works. So I'm still kind of looking around. I was just recommended one called the seventh gen that I'm gonna take a look at, and then we'll go from there. It's supposed to be very clean soap. Okay, so this is 20. And then we're gonna do 50 over the privacy on the rear. And they should be, oh shit, they should be really, really close.
how much pressure to use on your final pass. Um, I don't go crazy. I, I, you know, with a good squeegee, you don't have to apply a ton of pressure. Um, there, so there's always going to be water in between the film and the glass. It doesn't matter how hard you press. So once you press all that out, what you're going to see uh, are basically like wet streaks. So they're going to look like, hey, what are these? Not, not bright white streaks, but they're, they kind of blend in with the glass and everything like that. So when you're kind of checking everything over, it's, it's going to like, you know, from one angle, everything's going to look fine. Then you look closer, you get the light to bounce off it just right. You start seeing all these little like wet streaks and stuff like that. That's still moisture in between the film and the glass. Um, the, the real trick is just once you squeegee it out, just you might have like a couple little things to touch up somewhere along the edges. If you have like an air pocket or something like stuck in the middle and you let that tack up, um, then you're going to have problems. Oh, that's from doing that. I kind of thought, thought there might be something. I'm going to redo this one. Oh, I took the tape off. I should have left it on. There's like a small little fuzzy right here. So let me, <laughs> let me fix this. There, so there was something stuck to the glass that I didn't catch. It was all the way in the corner. And so I peeled it back. I got it out. And that usually means that you drag something back into the film. Sometimes you can get lucky, um, especially because I had a lot of space to work with on this one. That was not the case. It still looked bad. Not bad. Just not as good. So let's cut one out and, uh, and redo it. Do I have tape over there? No, I don't think so. Baby shampoo is good. The real problem we saw is Dawn 4X super concentrated formulas. That makes me feel better. I mean, I've been using Dawn Ultra, but I have, I've just been saying Dawn. <laughs> I didn't say Dawn 4X. But they put it in little letters. So if you look at the bottles, they're like... Right? That's what they say? Hang on, let me see. See? It just, it just says Dawn Ultra in like little letters here. 50% less scrubbing. So it's not even like a clear difference. I think the real problem is, uh, like I, I never liked that solution anyways just because you had to get two different things. So it was always annoying to explain. Now I think it's gonna be even more annoying to explain because you got, like trying to recommend one thing that you buy off of a site and another thing that you gotta get from a grocery store, this is gonna make it complicated. I would love to use just all type. You are gonna notice a slide difference. And here's the thing, it's not, it's not like I need it to ice skate on the glass. That's not what I'm looking for. But like that tack that you initially get when you first put the film on the glass and then you move it like a millimeter from that spot and it just like half of it, like more, a good amount of it slides and then it just grabs in one spot. That's what drives me crazy. And then you have to like ruin the film trying to get the whole thing to move, where you just need something that when you put the film on the glass, you can at least shift it a half inch to get it exactly where you need it to go. Without the right slip, that makes it really difficult to do. So when you have something that's just unfortunately overly grabby, then you're just fighting against it the whole time. We don't like to fight. We don't like to fight against our films. So inevitably, that'll probably happen on this car. I think it was happening with the door, but I'll kind of point it out when it happens. So 
less of a problem in the winter time, but especially when you're in a hot environment and you use like a lot of baby shampoo or something, a lot of baby shampoo doesn't fix the issue. So you set it on the glass and then it just like immediately sticks. And this was the problem that we had with using baby shampoo initially. It was like, it didn't matter how much we added. So the amount of soap didn't fix the issue. And honestly, using Dawn by itself didn't fix the issue either. Should always bring that up. So it wasn't necessarily the amount of slip, it was the kind of slip that you're getting. I think there's a difference. I'm not a chemist. But it like that's what was so weird to me about that solution. Was there's something in the baby shampoo that works well, and something that in the Dawn that works well, and then you mix them together, and it's like the best amount of slip that you can get, but you didn't have to add necessarily too much soap to try and do that, because I could have just used an entire bottle of baby shampoo. Yeah, so in the Carbon Plus and the Apex, definitely the amount of heat matters. The films soak up a lot of that heat and will continue to shrink after they've already been shrunk. So with most films, you'll put on a certain amount of heat and then you might get that film to slightly shrink farther because it, you know, it's hot. But it cools really quickly. With films with ceramic, they, like those ones, they'll soak up the heat and they'll hold it and continue to shrink. So if you have a curling issue and then you try and fix it with heat, you make it worse. Also, don't park a car outside in direct sunlight after tinning the windshield. Yeah, yep, I've had that happen with cars too. I'll tell you, on a busy day, that's a hard thing not to do. Because it's usually when you're done, you need to get it out and start on the next one. But what does it do, like shock it or something? You need to kind of like gradually grab to the glass. But what I can tell you for sure is I think that just accelerates the pro like, or at least the theory is I think it, it like partly accelerates the problem that already exists. But it's hit or miss. Because like with that new sample I tried, I mean, I didn't add any extra heat, I babied it, I used, you know, different soap entirely, and it still, it just curled right back off the glass, even in a cool garage, so. What percent is getting put on the front? We're doing 20, 20 C2. How much do you add to your tank besides the baby shampoo? Um, so I have a three gallon tank. I use about two and a half ounces of baby shampoo. And then I was using about an ounce of any other particular soap. So it was about an ounce of Dawn, maybe a little less. And so I've now tried subbing the amount of, like I'm playing around with it. I just tried all type by itself. And then I've, I'm also playing around with baby shampoo and all type trying to create a very similar effect to what I was doing before. And I think it's got mixed results. I think it's a little better, but I don't think it's quite where I need it to be.
But I got a, I got a hot, a hot lead on something else I can try. Yeah, so most tinners are also not going to have like a hair dryer laying around. I happen to have the other fusion heat gun and that has like the first mode on it is you can just turn it on and it just blows air with no heat. Most people have a heat gun and so it's going to blow heat and air at the same time. You just need to blow basically air, but it wasn't like a Again, it, it fixed the situation, but it wasn't instantaneous. I had to sit there and do it a handful of times until it finally decided to lock down. I mean, and all those little things always make me think that it's more adhesive and the slip that you're using, not necessarily just less, less of it. I don't know, it's just weird. I don't know why C2 is like no problems. That stuff will stick. <laughs> weird problem. All right, so let's get this in there. And hopefully this will turn out better. See, that went pretty good. Now, but I kept it moving pretty quickly. So at this point, like if I had to shift it a little bit farther over, shit's, shit's stuck, man. It doesn't give you much flexibility. And I haven't squeegeed anything yet. That's what, that's what worries me. It's so like when you shift something over and you just need a little bit more flexibility to fine tune it and then it ends up just locking in place so fast and then the only way to fix it is to literally pull it back and spray it or to like slap it until it just <laughs> shoots out of place and then you're way far over. Rick McIntyre would describe it like it's like opening a bag of chips. Like you, you struggle, 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 and then all of a sudden it just pops open and everything goes everywhere. We need a happy in-between. the part why did you put tape on the sides of the windows okay that's just for cleanliness it's an extra step um, I wasn't taping seals for ever I hated tape because I was only ever recommended painters tape the Tyvek or house wrap tape what it does is it essentially like any car that you pull in, it gives you a brand new seal on the sides. So it sticks, it's water resistant. So you put it on there and it's not gonna fall off. Painter's tape, you're gonna spray it a handful of times and then it's gonna fall off and painter's tape is thicker. So this is a quick way to just basically give the car a temporary brand new seal. So if you're fighting against felt, if you're fighting against an old seal, you know, so it's, you're gonna get a minimal effect off of a new car. But I still put it on basically everything that I do because it makes this much added difference. And so those edges where I would have a couple little things to touch up, I just don't see specs on the sides hardly anymore. So especially when you're newer, And then it also pulls out without pulling the, the tint out, right? So it's easy to clean up and everything. It's just the best of so many things. But especially when you're newer, when you're 
when you're learning how to tint, you're still trying to figure out how to tuck things into the side. And so what people naturally do is they'll clean the seal like 50 times over and wonder why they still have a dirty pattern. If you put some tape over it and you're still getting a dirty side, it's, it's not the seal. It's your installation. So that's kind of a point that I'm also trying to get across. So you just got to practice. But taping the seals, cleaning the glass, you don't need to go through and wash the entire car. You don't need to go crazy above and beyond with prep work and stuff like that. So here's what I do. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward and even a little more above and beyond than what I used to do. So I used to take just a plastic scraper and that's still fine, but it doesn't hurt just to take an actual razor blade over it. You can pick one or the other, that's fine. So what I'll do is I'll do basically like a broad surface scrape. Then I'll answer a phone call. Ugh. Hello, Tin Studio, how can I help you? Oh, they hung up. Okay, so then you scrape it and you wanna do that also with your seals too. So you can use a tri-edge, you can use a gator, gator blade. <sighs> so this is what I would pretty much use on every window and I still keep this around because this has a nice little angle to dig into the seals. Basically what you wanna do is you wanna loosen up all those stuff that is stuck to the window. And for most windows, they don't have glue sitting on them. So it's, it's just general wear and tear buildup, right? Unless you see stickers and adhesive and stuff like that. So if you want to be extra thorough, you can just use a razor blade. Um, a little less thorough, but still does 99% of the job uh, until you run into like a glue or something. A gator blade's great. Then I'll take a clay bar. Again, it's a little above and beyond. Um, you can get a very similar, you can, you can basically do the same thing with a, with a rag. Use like a good microfiber rag. Um, but you wanna just ensure that you get everything off of the top edge. So that's where you see all that black stuff from. So you can do the same thing with a towel, it's just sometimes a little bit more scrubby power. So whatever you can scrub along the top edge. Um, I like a clay bar because when you get into laminated windows, they have this little like crevice, and this is better for digging into that. When you have just a nice rounded top, it doesn't matter as much. Clean it off with a towel or a clay bar, squeegee top to bottom left to right, but you're going top to bottom because drips go down. Then you're going to squeegee out the sides. I'm using a tri-edge, or sorry, there's an easy reach. I typically use a tri-edge. There's literally no difference in that step from one tool to the other. You can literally substitute it out with like any corner tool. You're just squeegee from one side over, swipe both sides down. Then you can also flush the sides really quick, spray your window, and then it's, it's ready to go. From there, it's all your installation. I'm not blaming anything else on my environment. I, I could be tinning, like so, the main thing in an environment would be wind. I could be standing inside on a bucket of sand and have no problems tinning this window clean because what settles on the ground stays on the ground unless you have wind kicking it up. So if your wind is down, everything will be fine. And then keep that edge flat, and then we tuck it over into the side. And then same thing on this side. We pull this back, and then we slide this edge into the side. So if I have any point, oh no. It's a little, wow, where'd that little guy come from? See, that's me, that's not my environment. A little hair there. Slide that back over. So, line this up to the top. So like, on sometimes some windows, it'll be fine where I can have a little play in my film. So when I'm doing that whole tuck on one side, tuck on the other, the little shimmy shimmy, I need there to be a little bit of slide to the film because um, if it just locks up, I'm not going to be able to slide that little bit into place. 
That's how we can keep everything nice and clean. Slide it over, match up that top edge. And then the rest of it, I don't need to be quite as slidey. It's still a benefit to have it slidey, but it's not as important. Then we roll this up. And then we're gonna spray down the bottom, pull this liner out. See, cause usually the amount of spray that you put here will let it float enough to where if you have something a little bit more sticky, it's not as big of a deal because it's floating on that water. When you're putting some pressure and trying to slide it into place, that's where you need it to just be a little bit slicker so you can get it to move into place and then the rest of it is pretty straightforward. But I'm gonna keep playing around with stuff. I'm gonna keep trying stuff out. Kind of find a happy balance like I did before. If I found it once, I can find it again. So I think on most cars, that'll be fine enough. I think I'm gonna inevitably get to a car that's a little bit more hydrophobic and I'm just gonna have a bad day. But we'll see. All right, we can clean this off. Come on, come on, come on, come on. There we go. Tape pulls out. Kept my seals nice and clean. What software do you use in the plotter? Film cut. Film cut's been pretty good. They're getting a little bit more flexible. But there's, there's problems with, uh, with every software. <laughs> there's problems with everything. It doesn't matter. Put that, put that there. Put these things. Play bar, razor blade can go good. Roughly, how long do you estimate a full tin job to take? So, all right, let's look through. That is, that is good. So we did 20 on the front, and then we did 50 over the factory on the rear. Yeah, that's damn close. I like that. That's, you'll be happy with that. I saw something. <gasps> it's a water drip. Good. <laughs> I hate that. What is that thing? I think it's a water drip. It better be a water drip. It's a water drip. Yes. Okay, so um, a full job, like all, like a standard job really, so all the sides in the rear, you're going to want to shoot for about two hours uh, in like a regular shop environment. Um, three hours at the most. But if you take longer than two hours, um, like it just, it depends. It depends on your overall expenses and stuff like that. How many cars you can pull in in a week, even if you stay, you know, fully busy, two cars, three cars, three cars every day throughout the week, which generally isn't gonna be the case year round. You'll have busy times, you'll have slow times. So that's where I say like, you want a goal of, of two hours, unless you're charging more, unless you have lower expenses and it's not as like, I mean, I say lower expenses, but just 
usually people take their pricing into account for stuff like that. It's not the full story. But you need to be able to make money as a business. That way you got money to pay for things. You reinvest that in your business, in your personal life. So a couple hours is a good time frame to shoot for a car unless you're just generally charging, you know, more. And then still you want to shoot for two hours. Uh, when it's a windshield, then uh, I'll change things up to like two and a half to three hours. That gives you enough time to do um, like three to four full cars in a day, a couple sets of doors, and you know, you got flexibility. So not everything always goes to plan where you're going to have an appointment that's running later, you're going to get your car done quicker, you're going to take longer on this thing. That's generally how my days working for other shops would go. They would stack up my schedule, they would have things coming in, like so I'd have a 10 o'clock, I'd have a 12 o'clock, I'd have a 2 o'clock, I'd have a 4 o'clock, and then they would usually mix in sets of doors in that time because they would plan an hour for that set of doors, but I would usually get that done within like 30 minutes. What if you also have a strip and retent? That's, that's a big monkey wrench in your schedule. If you have a strip and retent, um, it's just gonna mess up your day. You have somebody else do the removal while you focus on the tinting portion because that removal could take you um, an hour or with really bad film, it could take you three hours to do a removal. So when you're trying to slot in time for it, it's a big unknown. So a lot of people end up undercharging so like working for a lot of shops, they would charge like 150, 160 bucks for like all the sides in the rear to be removed. Um, but we also had more staff, so we could have somebody working on the removal um, where if it's just one person, you need somebody else to really handle that. Otherwise, you're basically killing an entire half day getting most of the, getting like the removal done and then you got to worry about all the rest of the cars that you had to tint. So whenever I, I came into one of those shops that I tinted for mobily, and they're like, yeah, this one's also got a removal. Up here in Michigan, it just depends. We do have old bubbly tint. We have people that buy their cars out of state. Um, a good percentage of the removals would pull the film off and just leave a lot of glue behind. So that, that was helpful. It wouldn't completely ruin our day. But it definitely threw a big monkey wrench into it. Sometimes that would happen, like a client would even tell. They would schedule a tin appointment. And they, <laughs> I'd go to pull it in and be like, hey, there's tin on this already. And then they'd be like, oh, we didn't know that. He didn't tell us. Mm-hmm. And then I'd yell and scream and say, this isn't getting done today. I hate you. <laughs> it wasn't all that bad, but it wasn't fun. See, this little stickage, I hate when it does this. There we go. Get it to free up, slide over. To be fair, I'll run into that regardless, no matter how much soap I use, but the level at which it does that, I don't even know why that happens. I swear, film always picks one spot, clings to the glass really hard, and then it's just like, doesn't matter how hard you pull, you have to like free it up by pulling it back or creating a little ripple or something. It's annoying. I would like to be able to remedy that. That didn't happen until I started using like Avery NR and film since then. Kind of annoying. I did the same percent on an HRV except 20 on the rear Windshield over factory tint, 50 on the rear doors, 20 on the front. Really close match. Nice, very nice. Way to keep an eye out for that kind of stuff too. Because there's guys that will just blanketly do 20 on the front. And nowadays it's getting really annoying because there's so many like little differences from one car to the next. So even on this one, it's a compass. 
it should be right in line with all the other ones that are 20, but unfortunately it's not. Just metered a little bit lighter. So when I went out to look at the car, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's 20. And he's like, oh, I thought it was 35. It just seems a little lighter. And I'm like, hang on, let me grab a meter. And sure enough, I was a little off. And then you look at like an Explorer. The Explorer is like 15 on the back, which I'm like, damn. Explorer's going dark. Did a Yukon that was 15 on the back. Generally when you do 20 on the front and 15 and it have 15 on the back, that's, that's fine. But the other way around makes it way more annoying. Yeah, rear is a little dark and minus 5% now with the 20 over the factory, but not bad. Yep. Well, you know what we really need? I know some companies have this. I really need like a ceramic 30, 30%. Actually, I need 30% across the board. <laughs> that would take care of a lot of my those headaches there. The ones that meter a little lighter than 20. 35 is, is super common, but when you have those come in and they're like in the 25 to 28% range, I don't have a good answer for you. I then start digging through all my films to try and figure out, all right, let's put this on there. I really need 30. <laughs> need to fill that gap there. Alrighty, let's pull this out. Whoa, slow down. Thirty-three percent ceramic from Global. Thank you for that. I didn't know that existed. So I had a client that was like, "I'll have to, I'll have to check it out." I mean, it still sounds close enough to thirty-five, but. go. You know, only OCD tenders see that difference between the 5%. <laughs> well, the catch is when you start talking um, to like car people too. And there's some matches that are like really far off. So this was what drives me crazy. Somebody comes in um, with like a BMW and then your phone rings and then you can't answer. Hello, Tin Studio, how can I help you? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So the front doors uh, only, they would start at 120. Yeah, no problem, have a good one. Um, yeah, so if somebody comes in with a, like a BMW and then you have, what is it, like 20, that 28%, 25 to tw like 28. And then there's a noticeable difference because you got light coming in through the windshield too. So if you do 35, it's like, ugh, that's dark, that's light. But then you do, um, oh, is it in this drawer? And you do 20% and it's like noticeably darker. And that is something somebody will, will definitely notice. Whether or not they say anything, that's something different, but somebody, you know, that cares about their car, unfortunately will. So I'll ask, but I, I always hate putting them in that position. Would you rather go a little lighter or a little bit darker? Because I can't match that. And it's like, what do you mean you can't match it? <laughs> Was the size of your carpet shield? Uh, it's a 24 inch roll. 24 by like 200 feet.
buy them in a uh, in like three or four. If you get them from the hardware stores, you get a little break on them. But there's a there's another one. Um, so like you can find basically plastic carpet shield protectors and stuff. The reason why I look at the like, so they have stuff that is made for cars, like the collision wrap and whatnot. Um, but uh, an auto glass shop, they're like, yeah, we already got that. Here, let me try it on the door panel. And it literally fell right off. The carpet protectors are made to stick to fabrics. So they just have a little bit more bite to them. And then the, and while still being made to pull clean. So we're shopping in kind of a, a realm where we don't need them to do anything more than just tack enough to cover up a panel and then pull off. We're like, most of these are made so when you go to walk on them, you're not gonna put a hole through them and it's not gonna leave residue on a floor because it's for construction and stuff to keep carpet nice while you're like painting a house. So it's not a bad product to shop around for something much cheaper and just kind of see the different options out there. Because if you find, like one way they can save money on them is just by making them thinner, right? So carpet shield's pretty thick. But I, there was one I bought off of Amazon, I forgot. Hoss from Extreme Shades, he recommended it. He got one, it was thinner and it worked just as well. I just always forget to order it, so then we run to a hardware store and we can pick it up very easily. I say all that because I want people to find something else. <laughs> just saying it from day one, find me something better. This is like a Band-Aid solution. It works pretty well, and maybe it's the best. But I feel like there's something that would, like we just need to cover it up. So like the, the blue painters thing, that it's just if you swap that out with like this type of, <gasps> ooh, hang on. That's big brain solution right there. It took me a couple years to put that one together. Somebody take house wrap tape, put it with that plastic cover, you know, like basically swap out the tape from the blue. And there you go. You got your door panel covers that are now in a much more efficient, it's not my favorite way to do it, but it's a little mobile solution there. Probably still annoying to put on a door. Just did a Camry, now I'm here. Yay! Camrys are fun. So, doors should be all done. Now we got the back quarters to do and the back glass. Somebody asked if I could look at the back glass. I generally just cut them out on a plotter. What's going on with this? Oh, it would be. Damn it. No wonder it kicked your ass. <laughs> would, be, uh, would be a lot easier just to cut it out on the plotter. Maybe I'll hand cut it. Let's see. Because the trickiest thing about one of these is just going to be getting the size of the pattern. So 
So if you've got a big extra liner laying around, you could draw that out. But you need a glass board too. Ew, I don't want to use that squeegee for that. Patreon. Changes to see through. Ooh, cool. If you guys never saw Devin Nash's channel, go watch it. It has nothing to do with window tinting though, but it's it'll make you smarter. It's all about business. Generally it has to do with like live streaming subjects and like esports as far as what goes on in like what Twitch and YouTube and all those companies are doing, but there's so much good business stuff there. He's a smart dude. Lots of marketing stuff too. See, I gotta remember that I can do this. That's why I got these carts. These are the efficiency carts. So they're not tables. They're not for piling up lots of crap. They're efficiency carts. I'm supposed to use them like that. And then I take my sprayer and I put that on there too. If I get too lazy with them, they will become just clutter. But if I, if I focus, then they're really good. Okay, let's see what we're dealing with. Actually, let's wipe this part off because now that's all wet. So is this, what the heck? Ew. All right, so I've got enough space up here. So it's that top edge. And then, oh look, there's a little sea monster there. That's cool. So this is a pretty straightforward back window to tint. The hardest part is just gonna be getting your pattern. So one of the easier things that you can do is you can carry a, what, a 10 mil? You can pull the wiper off. Things like to rust in Michigan. So, you know, if it's a new car, it's not a headache to remove. It's, a, it's an older one. You know, they can, definitely, they can definitely stick, and that's not fun. I'm looking, I'm looking, where did I put it? Seriously? Wow, so much for efficiency. Oh no, they're both here. I'm just blind. Okay, so my light I'm gonna put in here just to help brighten up the back a little bit. I mean, we have two, we might as well use it, right? So now I can see this edge a little bit better. So I'm going to tape around, and one of them ran out of batteries, so I'm glad I put two. And if the other one dies, well, then I'm just terrible at charging things. Oops. All right, go around the wiper, stretch this down. Ew, that's another gross thing about this one. The wiper comes right up to the top and connects to the dots so they don't give you like any space. So you gotta cut a little bit lower into the where the wiper is. That's why you just always check your edges, especially when you glass aid them. I can kinda see. So I get up to about where I can reach. I'll cut this off. Make sure that's locked down. Around here, not so much. 
You get a squeegee off the glass too. If you just wipe it with a towel, it's gonna leave smears behind. Then it'll pull. The area that you don't want it to pull is gonna be down in these corners because they'll pull inwards rather than outwards. So we're gonna dry shrink prep this. That'll also keep a little bit of water off of it. Because we are gonna dry shrink this. All right. So I'm gonna shut off my light since I don't want that to die. I gotta remember to charge them. Uh, so we need 20, no 50, we need 50, right? We're doing 50 over the back. Um, if I had a short roll of 50, that would be amazing. I don't think I've got a short roll in 50. I can double check, let me check. Actually, I might. Oh my god, I do. Oh my god, I do. That's this one right here. Sick. Can you make an old... Can you make an old... Hand cut, drop tint down and use the defroster for a cut guide. It's not a bad way to do it. Um, yeah, because you're defro so if you cut along this line, then you get the same contour as this. The only thing that you don't get is the corners, but you can do a little touch up on the inside anyways. Definitely not a bad way to do it. So most windows, most hatches that I encounter, I've just always kind of tackled them this way. So like, put your wiper back down, you're gonna take a roll of film, you're gonna overlap like the entire back window. Um, Cause what you're gonna notice is that it's gonna rainbow. Also when you're dry shrinking, you're not giving the film anything to really stick to until you start carting it down. So making it just a little, putting a couple little wet spots on it or creating a wet line, that'll help. Cover the whole thing. And now we're gonna size it up. So we got a few things in the way. Let's grab a different blade too. Ah, oh, I missed. Can you make a video on shifting windows? What kind of shifting windows? Like frameless shifting windows? Or windows that shift side to side when you roll them down? Which is actually like most cars nowadays. Quality. Quality. Usually the first thing I do is I'll take care of the bulk film on the bottom. So I can clearly see where my dot line is going to be. And the thing that's getting in the way is going to be the wiper. So usually this would be enough to take care of it where I just cut out a section below where I'm working. But that's not going to quite be enough because like we said, this wiper comes right up to the dots. So I'm going to cut just below that line just for now, just to give myself some leeway. And then I'm gonna continue it past where the wiper is. Lift this up, lift the wiper back up. And then see all that kind of drops down and we're past our line and everything. So this just helps the film lay down in this area. So I don't really have to fight against it or worry about it. So as for the stuff up here, um, you can rough cut it a little bit, but you're kind of guessing. The main thing that we have to do is like hit our lines just right. So like this is a lot of film to kind of bunch up here. So that's why it'd be nice to like rough cut it a little bit. But if you basically, you pull the film back and you 
hold it straight, you can kind of roll it up without creasing it in that spoiler spot. And so from here, you gotta cut it right where the spoiler meets the glass. As long as that gives me a little bit of leeway. So now I got a little, a little slice there. So I'm gonna create a, a relief cut all the way up. Let's see how well this works on here. And then I'll roll the film back up in there. And from here, just a little, little poke a blade out, a little poke a -roo. And then you're gonna trim and kind of butt that film right up against that spoiler. And what I'm hoping is that we covered any gaps that we have. Same thing with the other side. Just gotta keep it kind of wedged in there. So really what that relief cut did, just give you a little bit more flexibility. Um, so when you're cutting this way, it doesn't pull all the film off of the glass. So you gotta cut it straight down, then you can worry about this side, worry about the other side, and then you should, in theory, as long as like the, your dot line didn't go all the way up into the spoiler, so that's why I check it beforehand. It's really close, so hopefully we got that close enough. And now, it's right in line with trimming the sides and trimming the bottom. So one thing to kind of ensure that we hopefully have enough film is extending the bottom just a little bit longer. So like Focus, VW Golf, a lot of hatchbacks will put the, that glass down a little bit farther from the spoiler. This is like basically butt right up against that. So I'm gonna cut, cut pretty much the outside of the line. Don't have to worry about it as much on the sides, but I'm kind of making my pattern a little bit bigger rather than slimmer. So if my top cut is then wrong, this should give me the wiggle room to make sure all my gaps are covered. And if it's way off, well then I just gotta cut out a new pattern and, and adapt. <laughs> which it could be. We'll see. I hope not. The sides don't matter as much because we don't really need to shift it left to right. You should have a natural bigger overlap. But the bottom, bottom and the top, that's where you'll kind of be cutting that close. Because if we need to shift it up, we need some more clearance from the bottom. So we're kind of make that a little bigger. And then this is also weird. So we're going to cut it right to the bottom of the spoiler here. But seeing this line is definitely helpful. So you kind of know where everything is. You don't have to put a light in and out and do a bunch of guesswork. Or just make sure you have a bright enough light that even if you have limo over the factory, you can still see it. But this is 50, so this isn't really a headache to see so light. Okay. So we'll cut off that, pull that. And now we gotta shrink it. So just to make things sometimes a little bit easier, I'll already have a glass aid pulled. Um, you can do that beforehand or after, or if you don't know if you're going to quite line it up right. But since we already got it cut out, we should be good to go. 
I'm just going to shrink this as is. Now, to you, you're you're plenty fine to like before you go to trim all this out, just to. Um, what am I trying to say? Shrink it ahead of time before you even cut all the sides in the bottom. But when it's not that curved of a window, you can do those steps a little out of order. I got a little carried away with talking about cutting it. So I just ended up going straight into cutting it before I shrunk it. This is how I used to do back windows. <laughs> I used to cut everything to size and then I would shrink it. I was using like Lumar at the time and that was one of the best shrinking films ever. It was so easy to shrink that stuff. So I would always size things and then shrink them. But it makes more sense to shrink something after you've already, uh, or shrink something first so you have more film to play with in case you burn an edge or something. So. So shrinking up to the spoiler, uh, you're not going to be able to see it. I mean, I can barely see it. So, it's a lot of guesswork. And then we can run my hand over it and kind of feel where it is. You can pull it down and then shrink it. So, I shrunk most of it and I could either touch it up on the inside or I can pull it down and shrink the rest of it on the outside. So, I don't know, to kind of show an example, I'll get, let me shrink this part first, and then we'll do that. But again, I'm overlapping some of the areas here. So there's just gonna be a little bit of touch up on the inside. go. Uh oh. I think we're getting some spam. There we go. Get that in place. Let's go ban somebody quick. These have been really rampant. I've seen them on so many channels. Okay, so remember this is overlapped a little bit on the spoiler, so it's sitting up. I'm just gonna leave it, right? I don't need to worry about that little spot. I'm just gonna touch it up on the inside if it's sitting up. But when a spot is pulled tight, there's generally very little that you ever have to do. It's not a super curved back window. Some of these little things, if something pops up, you just touch it up on the inside. It's no biggie. All right. That's all pretty good. If there's any big fingers that I see, I'll definitely knock those down ahead of time. Looks like it's just a handful of little ones. Then we'll see. Cross your fingers. Frozen. While well, I was illustrating a point. There we go. See, it was on it was on the spot where I was showing you exactly what was going on. That's good. <laughs> Intentional, <laughs> not really. All right, let's get a clay bar, let's grab a towel. Still gotta do those quarter windows. All right, um, I don't see it being cut short here, so that's a good sign. 
And like I said, cut a little bit extra just to give yourself some wiggle room in case you need to shift it around. Like that's really what you're doing with a back window or a quarter window. Anytime you have dot matrix borders to tuck the film behind, it's an awesome thing. The only thing that then gets in your way is the paneling. So some panels, they give you a little bit of space. Some they press tight against the window. Most, most cars, especially in certain price ranges are, are just like, or if they're made in America, most of them are gonna give you a little bit of room. And then some of them will not. Nice. Just gonna feel around for any sticky bits. I think we're good. Please repeat everything that I missed. <laughs> Bam. I should do a hot phrase so when somebody annoys me, I can say ban and it'll ban the last person that talked in chat. <laughs> why, are you, why did this kick back on? Is it leaking? Oh, this is a little bit. Do I get, oh, I gotta tighten this up. Oh, okay, that's why it's leaking. Oh my God, how tangled is this? I just wanna, this was leaking. I've shown this once or twice before. These are awesome little connectors and they're like, these are brass. I found these on, believe it or not, Amazon, <laughs> where you'd literally find everything. So, not everything, but, so I'm gonna do a little example here really quick. We'll top it off. So this is my tint keg. It's awesome. And I'm really happy with this setup right now. So I bought this air compressor. This one was, uh, it's a California Air Tools one. It's specifically just a quiet air compressor. This is a little baby air compressor. So it's not quite a shop air compressor, but I got it for the balloons that we'd explode. I wanted a really quiet one, but we don't really do that right now, so it's been awesome for filling up the keg. Um, so the air hose, they have these nice little clip things. So you can just pop this on. It's just an air chuck. They just grab onto the valve stems. Um, so I have this set to like 90 PSI right now. So when it fills up, all I have to do is this. Just clip it on. I can walk away. And then that air compressor will kick on Fill it, make sure this is filled to 90, top off the rest of the tank, and then it'll shut itself off. And I can just, I can just go walk away. It's nice, it's quiet, it's convenient. So this is definitely full. You can tell that from this gauge right here. And then you got another little gauge here that fills the tank up to their red line and then it's made to automatically shut off there. So, and shut off. It's kind of awesome. So, I like it. You should start a podcast. Be cool to have different guests in the industry. Oh, what the heck? Let's buy my tink. Oh my God. Nope, nope. I don't. Fuck around with big old spiders. Ugh. There's a there's a few of those floating around. Patrick's got one. Uh, Tint was used to do them. You should check out all the Tint was ones, and the Patrick ones. Like if you want to hear some some people talk window tint. Um, check out both the window tinting business one. He's got like six or seven of them. 
Um, and then go on the uh, TintWiz YouTube channel. And he's got like a bunch of them too. He, he would like interview people from shops and stuff like that. It's not, not quite up my alley. There's more YouTube reasons for that. But it's that other people can definitely take that on. There's been some good ones. But, you know, I, I forget about this. And I think I've told, oh, God, poor alligator. I think I've told him. I wanted to have him... Um, what would be really cool is literally for me to continue doing what I'm doing and then possibly talk to somebody while I'm on stream while I'm doing that, but. I think what's most annoying is anytime I look at numbers, whenever you look at numbers, you can see clear directions, um, what kind of to do and what kind of not to do. We're going to purchase a billboard. Uh, you're going to want to talk to a, um, like a glass company or you're going to want to go on like local classified ads and just find people that are getting rid of glass. So like there isn't much out there for like frames and stuff, mostly because it's all like different sizes and whatnot and they're generally just expensive. So Mao Pod, M-A-O pod station that was one of them but you have to buy you buy a big piece of glass to go in it and it's a really cool mobile uh like roll around shop peel board other than that you're kind of just like i think some people have instructions on how to make one um, but it's basically just making a frame and whether or not you want it to be roll around or against the wall but the glass if you want new glass just call a a glass company and they'll give you a big piece for some monies. But that's what everybody's using is just glass. Plexi you can use for a little while. You'll just gouge it up. That's why glass typically works better. All right. Uh-oh. I feel like I kicked something. <gasps> oh, I almost knocked a roll of film over. <laughs> I thought so. All right, so let's... Line this sucker up. So we made the whole thing a little bit wider. So the sides will definitely be wide. I didn't know how wide, but you find out once you have to match that up. And then we're sitting over the top edge right now, and we're gonna slide this down, hitting that panel just a little bit. So let's pull that back. And then, shoop. There we go. And then we're gonna look at all the top. We went a little far down. We're gonna, we're gonna match that up. And with all that said, we are short. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> what did I say? I said it's easier to plotter cut these. All right, so I've got a definite gap there. Um, it's hard to see, and to be honest, I don't even know if you'd be able to really see unless you look through like the entire, entire thing. Oh yeah, yeah, that's when you can see. So when you match those up here, there's always like this little wiggle room on where your cut's gonna be. So if the glass is sitting down a little lower, it's easier to get it up a little higher. Um, unfortunately, that area needs to be even farther up than what I cut. Because when you do this, it's 50, so I couldn't see it. So this covers all my gaps at the bottom. I even made the bottom longer, and it's still, on this side, it comes pretty close. On this side, it's definitely a little short. So that's how I, <laughs> thanks for watching.
Believe it or not, the pattern's not completely ruined, though. I mean, yeah, it is, but... We can either cut a plotted one, or we can use that as a template, and then basically cut an oversized, re-shrink it, and then install it. So I think for the sake of everything, we'll go, we'll slap this in the plotter and we'll see how this goes. But yeah. Not not surprised that it uh, it kicks somebody's ass. Um, it just pinches. It pinches pretty tight there. So I would still do the same thing. Like, so if you're hand cutting that, the way that I would handle it is I, I typically do most everything the same until I run into a problem like that. So the way I would readdress it is I put another piece up there and I would just make sure I cut extra long uh, on, the, on the bottom. Um, or when I cut the top, I then pull it back and then shift it up a little bit more to make sure all my gaps are covered. It's kind of a hard thing to do because you can't really see until you get the tint mashed up in there if you're over the edge or not. But I would, I would stretch it out a little bit more. So I tend to do everything the same until like I run into a situation like that where it's like, it probably should have worked out, but it just didn't. Um, and then I'll make those little adjustments and stuff. So on this one, I would literally, like, rather than walk through the exact same thing again, um, I'm just going to go over to the plotter and I'll create a new problem. What is this? Hang on. Let me, let me double check what you were doing. Uh, so 19, I always like to make sure that we're within kind of like an ear shot. Would a Sharpie help with that top edge? Yes and no. So if you, if you took something like a little thinner, like um, if you took like a, um, like a big enough release liner from like a previous back window, then you mark everything and then you oversize it on a glass board, that would be way easier. Just taking up a Sharpie and digging it up there, it's, you're still kind of getting the same issue. Like you're marking a line and the tint's folded. Um, so it's another way to like mark the line without making the cut first. And then you could then oversize the cut uh, if you want to do it that way. So we're 22 to 17. Oh yeah, we're all, we're all good. So then we're going to take this, drop this in here. And then we're also going to get the quarter windows out. This is why I love the plotter for stuff like this. Because the hard to see stuff for an individual is where the plotter really shines. Anything that takes you longer uh, to cut out because it's hard to see and hard to get to, plotters will speed you up. So we're gonna put that where it needs to go, and then we're gonna click cut, and then we're gonna freak out. It's not gonna work. I'm just kidding. It'll probably work. Any advice for tinning a back window with defroster lines? Every back window has defroster lines. What, uh, what problems are you having with the lines? You just tint straight over them. This one has defroster lines. <laughs> all right, now you let all this go out and then drag it out a little bit more. We'll make our cut. 
Then we're gonna jump right into weeding it. Please don't be. No, I know what that is. Making sure that wasn't my alcohol solution. That's good, let's just leave that there. That's convenient. What? Oh, oh, I see what they do. Well, that makes sense. my own car soon. I've seen people sand them down. Oh, uh, gotcha. No, you can just tint straight over them. There really, in most cases, isn't anything special that you have to do. Um, you will see some people that like to sand down the rear defrosters that um, sometimes do kick up air bubbles, so it's only a handful of vehicles out there that, that'll do something like that. I typically don't worry about it until I know it's a problem for sure. So then we'll cut this out. Assuming we gotta reprep everything, right? Okie dokie. I'm glad dry shrink prep, if I can find it, dries fast. Because I noticed when we did the classes, <laughs> and if you make a mistake, your Like the time to get back to where you were is really important because you don't want to waste a lot of time redoing steps that you already did. So we had a pattern that didn't quite line up. So now we have to shrink it and put it back in and then we'll be back to where we were. So especially with all like the prep steps, that's not super, super fun to do. So, I would assume this one's gonna be a little oversized. So we will shrink it in stages. I'm gonna shrink what we can for the top first. Just pull it down below that spoiler, rather than just try and butt everything up into place. It's gonna take a little bit longer because it's all wet right now from sticking to the glass board. Having a dry cut table is something I forget about. I'm gonna make a plotter video here pretty soon. It was originally gonna be a Workhorse 2 video and it is gonna be around a Workhorse 2 video. Um, but it's also gonna be, I think the more important things are everything Everything that helps speed you up in using a plotter, like basically everything that I've learned about plotters over the past like 15 years, we'll go over those things. Yeah, pop 
that back up. Actually, we could go a little farther down and make it a little easier. There we go. Perfect. Those boxes look good. Nice. What's that? Ooh, here, bring one over here. I want to look at it. And I'll finish this up. Look like they're going together good. Oh, heck yeah, that's super clean. Oh, and they get a little bit of gloss to them, too. That's sick. Nice. Do you have to tape them on the inside? Oh, yeah, so they're different than the old boxes. Like, they have yeah. little tabs. So, like, <gasps> oh. You don't even need tape or, like, a staple or anything. Oh, shit. Oh, that's awesome. Dang. Look at that. So, we got new... Uh, we got new GeoShield boxes, or Geo got new GeoShield boxes. So we're gonna be swapping out all the old ones so they sent a bunch of pretty ones so I can put them on the shelf. They look good. So the old ones, I don't notice this with very many boxes, but you see that little sheen to them? That's nice. Usually you just see like a flat color. I mean, these ones, they look great, especially when they're clean. But like, look at that, look at that little shine to them now. We're going to not put that on the floor. So these are all going to go up up the shelf. They look good. Never, never take pretty company boxes for granted. They cost money. Have you ever seen a company with ugly, boring brown boxes? They're just, it's not that they sell bad film. It's that they don't care about their packaging. Trying to save every dollar they can. Don't we have like a, do we have a mod? Yeah. They're back. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Those are the boxes. That's right. Okay. So, now we saved a lot of time by, as, if the pattern works, we saved a lot of time by just cutting it out. That's always the, it's always the question. Should work though. But yeah, all those little steps, when you have something that's a little bit more complicated to cut out because it's really hard to see. Plotters are great. I especially like them for quarters and back windows because you can always tuck behind things. So as long as they're like honestly a little big, that's way better than being a smidge too short. You just don't want anything to leave gaps. 
So in this case, water is going to kick my ass. But that's how I do an outside pattern. Obviously, I got to change something for this one. Get that. And then, oh yeah, we got to pull it from this way. Because this goes up. We don't want to have to upside down ourselves. Wide on the sides, just like I cut it. Nice. <laughs> and then, yeah, much cleaner. They got even a little loop for that wiper. And then everything, remember that panel? Kind of presses in just in this spot a little bit, so we'll pick that up. Slide our film down. Look for those edges. Push them up just past there. Much better. Yep, that lined up really nice. So I'll typically do plotter cutouts on trucks, on SUVs. It's really where they let me down are always like the exposed edges. So it's just hit or miss. Some of them can be really good. Some of them not so good, and you never know until you get everything cut out. So we get a solid W for the, uh, the plotter today. You know some people like I've got, I've got plenty of my frustrations with just different things. So I don't just blindly hate a plotter just to hate on it. I'm a big tech dude, so anything that makes my life easier and faster, I'm all for it. It's just when those systems start to let you down, that's when I have a big gripe with it. So if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. There's a couple things today. <laughs> I asked about Lexan earlier. Plotter kicked my butt. It is what it is. The worst thing, one of the worst things that you can do is just be blindly biased against any one particular system without at least giving it a fair shake or understanding some of those pros and cons. I've worked with plotters every day at other shops. There was one shop in particular that literally, like we had to use a plotter. They didn't want us cutting on most cars unless the plotter didn't work out. And they had a really nice way of handling it too. So basically what we would do is we would cut everything, we would weed it on, weed it on glass boards, shrink them on glass boards, and install it without ever touching the pattern to the outside of the car, except for the back window. That's the only one that we would put on the car. So that helped keep drip marks all off the paint. So when a customer brought their car in, it basically left in the exact same state that it was dropped off at without having to explain drips. Like, hey, when can I get a car wash? Well, right away if you want to. Yeah, I'm gonna have to make a, so. <laughs> I've got more comments on the workhorse too. Basically, get rid of your catch basket on the workhorse too, because it's just gonna be annoying. That was one reason I had a bunch of little hangups on it. That fired too quickly. There's that, there's that, there's that.
Little baby window. That's right. But it is another window. More tint. There we go. Look at that. We got the black magic squeegee right now. Ooh. God, that one's grippy. It's not a terrible squeegee, it's just grippy. But it forms really nicely. I have my Fusion one somewhere. I just don't remember. I set it down for a video, and then I, I don't know. It's hanging around here somewhere. So let's go do the other one. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. <laughs> chicken sounds good. Still using John. Just got my big order from GeoShield. <sighs> yes and no. See, how do I how do I summarize this? So like everything requires like a big explanation. So I've been using I think Dawn and Baby Shampoo is an amazing mix. It's my favorite. Um they called me up. They said, "Hey, we're having curling issues with Carbon Plus and Apex, and I've experienced some of that. That has to do with windshields. Um, so they looked into lots of soaps and what people are using and tried to narrow down some sort of like common denominator for, for problems. Dawn seemed to be a common thing. They looked into like, you know, what, what type of Dawn most people are using. And they're like, the 4X Dawn, so like the really strong Dawn, just has a lot of shit in it that's not great for window film. So... Um, I primarily use mostly baby shampoo with a little bit of Dawn. I still think that's, that's great. I am a little nervous to continue to use it though. So we're messing around with uh, Fusion All Type. Still doing like the same type of thing. Mostly baby shampoo and then doing like a little mix adjustment with a different soap because I've already tried just All Type and it's just, it's not my favorite. So just keep that in mind. Fifty fifty all type and J and J. I'm I'm leaning towards Oh that's not it. That's just another water thing. What's this one? What? That wasn't it. Oh, I grabbed the wrong bottle. Okay, so this is my alcohol mix. 50-50 all type and J&J. &J. I think I'm leaning towards that. Um, so I added, like, I did like a three-quarter mix, and it seemed pretty good. But then I the next go around, I added more all type. And so that's what this was, but this was with C2. I think it worked out a little bit better. But again, this is with C2. This stuff slides a little easier. It's when you get into... Pro Nano and like Pro Classic that you're going to have it be a lot more grabby. But I appreciate that. Seems to be what I'm going towards. I still don't... I still don't like that option. I don't like... Like, because soap is one of the most asked questions, period. And I never liked having to, like, mix the two together, but at least I could go to the store and buy both of them in the same place. Having to go, oh, yeah, make sure you go get baby shampoo, and, oh, yeah, make sure you go get 
all type from somewhere else. I hate that. I really do. It's not that people can't do it. It's that it just overly complicates what I think should be a very simple thing. It's so like, how much soap should I use? Use this much of this thing. I'm sure we'll get there. I told Geo they need to make their own soap. They said you should make a soap. <laughs> I said, what the fuck? <sighs> I think they're going to have potentially a lot more issues than they think. Not from like film failing, but from user experience. Okay, so this is my other roll that was 20% carbon. I'm definitely gonna forget what that was. And I'm definitely gonna just throw it out. What is this? This should be that carbon. Black Mergium, baby shampoo, tint, oh, and tint soap. <laughs> I didn't say it quite like that. <laughs> but I did say that be a, it'd be an interesting thing to collab on for sure. I'm not looking to break into another space like that, though. But when there's an obvious problem, man, like... It needs to be an obvious solution. That's like, that's where Glass Aid was born out of. Especially getting back into doing videos and stuff. It's like, all right, I'm mobile. I need to not scratch windows and I need basically a foolproof solution so people can also not scratch windows. And I understand a lot of people don't have glass boards or plotters. So if you have glass boards and plotters, you have other ways of remedying it. When you're on site or in a space that doesn't have a glass board or anything, that's when you need something like glass aid and there's a handful of little solutions that all kind of work. <laughs> Where's vanilla ice? <laughs> He's solving problems. We got a problem, yo, I'll solve it. That's what he's doing. He sang that, and then he was like, you know what? That's my mission now. I'll be solving problems. You got a problem? Go, I'll solve it. Everybody took him up on that. So get in line. <laughs> Wasn't he in the Ninja Turtles movie too? He did like the ninja rap. <laughs> God, those movies were amazing for the time they came out. Those and the three ninjas. <sighs> oh God, ninjas used to be a big thing, weren't they? last good movie you saw? Probably the Ninja Turtles movie. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know. I'm trying... So, I always enjoy watching whatever the more recent Marvel movies are, because they're, they're usually entertaining. The Doctor Strange ones, I was kind of mixed on. There were parts of it that were good. Parts of it that were kind of strange. Um, God, what else has come out since then? Whenever I'm 
Hold on, like whenever I'm asked that, I never quite remember what I just saw, but I know I'll think of it, so I just gotta think. I just gotta use my brain. Hang on. Let me think for a minute. Is that you? <laughs> do you still do boats? No. <laughs> I retired after doing my second one yesterday. Man, I'm on the same boat. <laughs> I stopped doing boats. So I had the, the first boat that was really annoying. Um, but I got it done, and then I got one that was similar, but a five-piece window. Oh, hey, skateboard. Um, I got a five-piece window, and, uh, he dropped it off. I gave it a good, like, solid day of trying to get it tinted, and there's just too much in the way. I just couldn't get it done. So I told him to take it. Take it. I don't want to do it. Cannon. Have you tried seventh generation free and clear dish soap instead of Dawn? No, but it's on my list. Um, we go to Target and other grocery stores fairly regularly, so I just gotta remember next time we go, especially Target, like we're always at Target. So I gotta go, I gotta go get that. Do you have any direct comparisons of Apex versus Carbon Plus as far as heat rejection goes? Uh, not any pictures or videos, but I can 100% say Carbon Plus is good. Apex is way better. Pro Nano is a little better than Carbon Plus. So on a heat box, if you're, so I set the number, I started with the BTU meter at like 300. Dyed film, hardly changed. Carbon drops it down like, C2 carbon goes down to 150, carbon plus goes down to 100, pro nano goes down to like 75, and then apex goes all the way down to like 30. So apex is the best, pro nano is a, is a close second, um, but carbon plus is just not quite as good. But it's still really good, it's just not quite as good. After tinting for so long, what keeps it fun for you? Does the idea of doing something different car or time? Oh, does the idea of doing a different car every time keep it fresh or is it more so about your long-term goals? Definitely long-term goals along with the channel. That's what makes it fun. The challenge is like a, the channel is a constant like creative battle. Some of it's good, some of it's not, but it keeps the whole thing fun or at least interesting enough. So, I, like, I don't know what I would be doing. I, I, like, I, I always like computer stuff. I'm not a programmer, though. I could definitely get into a number of different, like, technical things. But everything that centers around doing one thing over and over, I think, always gets boring. I think the real key for me was trying to make it different enough so it was always interesting. So, like... Da, 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 YouTube studio. Um, this is the video that I'm trying to fix right now. And I honestly hate having to do this. Oh, yeah, that definitely killed it. <laughs> uh, I, I just, like, jokingly changed this title before I started the live stream. Um, so, like, if you go to content... When you make a video, you have to figure out how to sell it. That's like the easiest way that I can describe this. So like Walmart Tint So Dumb It's Genius ended up doing 900 and almost 20,000 views. That's awesome. That's, that's super, super cool. You, I can make a lot of different videos. Some of them do okay. Like this one did 43,000 views, but it was over the course of quite a few months. This one blew up randomly, but it didn't get a lot of watch time. It's 570. And then I got lots of them that did like 10,000, 14, 16, 20. This is 285,000. So like they kind of bounce all over the place based on like your thumbnail along with your title. 
And that's the problem that always drives me crazy is trying to figure out, like, making a good video is one thing. Figuring out how to get people to watch it is a, a whole separate marketing issue. Um, so, like, for window tinting or anything, doing the same thing over and over again definitely gets it, makes it boring. Um, so, yeah, when I was tinting for shops, tinting car after car, you basically, like, you just kind of look at how many obstacles are in the way of you going home and doing what you really want to do. Doing the channel here, I literally built this around what I'd like to do. So I like doing the videos, and I like um, a lot about tinting, mostly, like, when you get good at it, it's relatively fast turnaround. You're around cool cars. Um, it's not a headache to do. It's fairly clean. So like this whole job start to finish, you know, it could be done in a, uh, easily under a couple of hours. How long have we been streaming? We've been streaming for two and a half hours. That's fun for me. So that was really my way of making a regular thing fun. Um, but there's other aspects of it. Like I really enjoy the business side of things too. So just figuring out how to uh, like sell your products, offer more things, do different things, just whatever you can do to make it more interesting for yourself. I think just being stuck in the same thing over and over for hours on end will make anything boring and tedious. But having enough freedom to break away from it and then also like, like, cause if I stop streaming, I'd be really sad. I like streaming, it's a lot of fun for me. But if I only streamed, it becomes a job and a chore. So I need breaks from it. Same thing with tinting. Like if I only tint all day every day, it gets annoying and tedious. Um, so being able to like shoot videos around it and then being able to make enough income to kind of not have a super heavy schedule every day is really, really nice. Um, so just figuring out how to create enough flexibility in like your own schedule will make what you do a lot more entertaining. So like, a big goal for us was buying a, buying a house and like kind of like settling in and figuring out, okay, so this is kind of what I like to do. How do I make this sustainable long term? And another question I asked myself is like, okay, if I was to do one thing for like the next five years, because five years will end up going way quicker than you think, what is that one thing that you could do for like the next five years that would be halfway interesting to yourself? Um, for me, I was asking that question about my channel. So like I looked at all the different types of videos that I made. I was like, what, what is something that I can always fall back on that I can do regularly? And that for me was always the live streams. So there's a lot more live streams on this channel. And as time kind of frees itself up, then I'm able to splice in, uh, like put aside days now to shoot a video and then edit and then get some stuff up on the channel that's not just live streams. So I have a lot of fun making stuff like that and I obviously love when it does really well, but I can't rely on that 100%. So I'm always shooting for videos to go really well, need something to rely on, and then the center cornerstone of everything is literally like just doing tint jobs, figuring out the best way to bring that to people. Titles for the video, can you make your own ceramic tint or is spray on ceramic tint a thing? Mmm, spray on ceramic tint. The adding spray there is kind of interesting. I didn't think about that. I didn't spray it in the thumbnail. I dripped it, though. Spray on ceramic tint. I'm going to change it to that, but I'm, I'm going to change it again. I got to improve that one a little bit. Spray, Ugh, I gotta figure out a way to word it. I gotta deliver this car though. This is, this is a problem that, that's always hard to solve. Liquid tint. No, I think, so what I can tell you is the main problem is like, there's an inherent intrigue with Walmart tint it generally does well, but it also has to do with being very relatable. And whenever I branch outside of things that are more for entertainment, there's just 
not much interest and a little bit of a disconnect. So I thought ceramic coatings might be, you know, we're looking at ceramic tint, but I don't think most people even know or care about ceramic tint. So then making a video exclusively on clowning around with tint and making it ceramic, like when you're watching it, it's cool. It's just figuring out how to get somebody to watch it. That's always the hard part. Because, like, if you look at the click-through rate, it wasn't even that bad. I don't know what's going on. So, like, the view duration's pretty good. It's, like, four and a half minutes. That's fine. That number will eventually go down, but it's just, like, a title away from doing well, and I just don't know what it is. I always think I'm making too many words in titles. That's bad, right? Shorter is better. Um, yeah, however you can quickly deliver what you're trying to say. So the lengthier, um, I, I, I try and avoid filler phrases and stuff. Like, this is the greatest window tint ever or something like that. It's like, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Like, this is the greatest. And then, like, you figure out what I'm saying later on. I always forget of a really good example every time I'm trying to explain this. But for some of my videos, like Walmart tint, that's at the very beginning. So you immediately know within the first two words what the video is kind of about. So I'm always trying to do that. Bold text is good, yeah. Adding, adding like a couple bold letters at what you're trying to emphasize, that's always good. I watched the whole video. I was freaking, <laughs> I was freaking at how much of the expensive liquid you wasted. Oh, we we wasted far more in the thumbnail than any part of that video. Both of those was literally just upside down. I've got I had so many pictures trying to do that thumbnail just right. That was the best one that we found. So throwing some font in the actual thumbnail might help. Yeah. Yeah, when you figure out like what your title should be, I can add something to the thumbnail. So you can kind of say two things with only typing one. SIO tint. That gets too technical though. Like so ceramic coatings. So the original title was like will ceramic coatings make any tint ceramic. That was that was I think a fairly strong one, but I just think nobody cares about ceramic tint. I don't know. So the whole video might just be doomed. <laughs> it always makes me a little sad because then I kind of get pigeonholed into like making the same types of videos and I like to try and branch out. But again, if this video, if videos like these just don't do well, then like, you know, you do it because you like to make it. But again, part of it's like you might like to make it, and then you also think that there's a good chance this will do well. So this video had every chance to do this. What were you trying to convey? Oh, I was trying to talk more about, um, I was trying to talk more about uh, like w the differences between ceramic coatings and window tint was kind of the idea. So could you take ceramic coatings and make regular window tint ceramic? That was like the whole premise of the video, but trying to just saying making regular tint ceramic isn't, isn't enough. Eventually I'll just, make tint ceramic. Eventually, I'll probably just settle with leaving a title, and then I'll, I'll be able to move on as soon as I post another video, and then I'll focus on the next one. It's just always really important to try and put any type of thought into making it better. Waterproof tint. See, it's, there's like things that tenors understand, and then there's things that regular people understand and trying to figure out that happy balance. Waterproof tint is like, oh, I thought it was already waterproof.
you could say something like, will ceramic coatings... I could just do something like this and just completely block heat. I don't think that's DIY ceramic tint. Yeah, I tried that already. It didn't work well. That was another one that I tried, like DIY ceramic window tint and just keep it very short. It still didn't start to catch anything. Will ceramic coatings block heat? I don't know. I don't even think this is very strong. Will ceramic coating destroy window tint? Um, we didn't really explore that so much. <laughs> Believe it or not, I got so tied up with trying to block heat. So like, this is your best indicator too if your video is doing well. Whenever you make a change, sorry. Whenever you make a change, um, your view count in real time let it sit for a little bit, and if it starts to at least double, then you're really on the right track. Like, you need to see a, a, a dramatic improvement. So before I let, went live, with the last title, I was at 46, but it seems like, see, it's kind of dropping off and stagnating. Eventually, it's going to drop down to zero, and then I changed the title, and it dropped in half, so that was a bad change. So then, I don't know. I don't know, but it's it's good to talk about this kind of stuff because I, I don't think most people realize this is how much uh, can go into like the most important thing on a video is is the title. So if you can figure out what that title should be, it, it can take a because you can make a good video that just won't get watched. That's just fact. It's unfortunate, but it's true. You need to figure out what people, what, what about what you're doing really clicks with your audience. And seriously, the last video that I did, um, the Walmart, that started out with three or four bad titles. Nothing was doing well. And then I figured out this title. I was driving home one day and I was like, oh, this is actually a really good title. And I immediately changed it and let it sit and it did amazing. So it's tough. It's tough to do, but eventually you can figure it out. I can't do it with every video, but it's definitely worth uh, worth looking into. Block user on YouTube. All right. Well, we gotta we gotta check out here. If I super chat, will fog machines go off? Yes. So you better do it quick, cause I gotta I gotta jump off here. If you're trying to go cheap on ceramic tint, you might as well just buy Walmart tint. <laughs> well, true. The idea, like one of the interesting things is like, okay, let's say you already got your car tinted and there's ceramic coatings. Will it do anything to, to give you some sort of ceramic uh, benefit for heat? They don't advertise it like that. I explain all that in the video though. But yeah, yeah, it was, it was kind of like one of those like, hmm. Ceramic coatings, lots of sprays, glass cleaners, soaps. Let's just try and knock it all on window film and see what happens. So that for me was like a fun question to kind of play around with and answer. Definitely wasn't expecting anything to work out. I've already talked to people on it. Super chat. Oh, it did go Jesse off. I didn't even touch it. Five dollars. I was about to because you asked, but yeah, it actually went off. I was worried it wasn't going to. Jesse, Jesse with a five, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Walmart ceramic coatings versus tint. So I actually bought them all on Amazon. So that's still pretty strong. But like I bought expensive ones too. I bought some legit ones. Uh, so I, I, I think I had that in an initial title, something like that, um, or ceramic coatings with Walmart tint, something like that. 
didn't didn't work. Kind of just have to keep throwing stuff against the wall and be patient and just wait for it to uh, wait for it to maybe do well or not. So we'll see. I made another title change. You can find them at what you could buy them at Walmart. I'll see. The Adams graphing is good stuff. Yeah, I hear great things. I looked up videos about it too. So then like graphene window tint, but I don't know. I don't know what people are looking for or what'll get recommended. You can just try a bunch of stuff. Alrighty. Um I'm gonna shout out some super chats though. So big shout out to Jesse, Daniel Reyna, Daniel Reyna, and Daniel Reyna. Thank you so much for the support today. I really appreciate it. Maybe something in the form of a question could intrigue the audience. Yeah, that's all true, but how do you word it? Can you combine tints and ceramic coatings? OK. Um, I would. That's a good example of a title that I would, like if it was onto something really good, I would tweak. So like, can you combine, I'm already like three words in and I have no idea what the video is about other than combining something. So like, so I would try and shorten it up where like combining tints and ceramic coatings, that way you can kind of condense it. Those are things that I always play around with. So like I figure out like a longer way to say something or think of something and then I try and change words to get it compressed as much as I can. Do a vote about what people want? No. <laughs> people don't know what they want. That's the thing. People don't know what they want until they've served it. So it's a fun, it's a fun thing to kind of talk about for me. Um, and I sometimes get some, some interesting takes um, of like a of a category or a way to kind of differentiate it, something that like I didn't think of. So like with window tint, you can then start talking about like legality, right? And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're talking about the law on window tint. And with ceramic coatings, it's like, okay, you can talk about like ceramic coatings, but then there's like hydrophobicness, there's um, IR heat rejection, there's, um, you know, how many avenues can you can combine those? So like one of the things about like the, what was, I could have made a video about static cling window tint and then just called it static cling Walmart window film and it would have been really bad. But then I figured out a way to like Walmart, like I, I approached it in a different way and then the title was then Walmart tint, this took me a while to come up with after I posted the video, was Walmart tint so dumb, it's genius, is then all of a sudden like, what, why? How can you have a tint so dumb as genius? And then the video kind of explains it. And then it's like, oh. So figuring out what avenue to go down with any of those things is uh, it's always, it's always tricky. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm going to think about it some more. I got to deliver this vehicle, though. Uh, so thank you guys so much for tuning in today. I appreciate you. Thank you for the support. Thank you for the supers. Um, I'll, uh, I think I'll be back tomorrow. I don't know. It's definitely slowed down some, but we've also been moving and doing a bunch of other stuff too. So time to uh, record and post more videos and, uh, and yeah, settling into August. It's already August. Then we're going to come into winter. Oh, my God. I'm not ready for summer to be over. <laughs> it's only been around for two months. All right. I'll see you guys. Bye.